I am from the Office of Counselors of the State Council of China. My name is Chao Zhonghuai, and I'm going to be moderating panel number three. We are going to get into our discussion this afternoon. The topic for this panel is educating in training for innovation. First off, we will have from the National Science Foundation the assistant director there, Ms. Joan Farini Mundi. Dr. Mundi has worked for many universities and research institutes. She has been long in the field of education and research particularly in the area of training for science and math and technology talents. Her topic today is education programs to develop ta talent, a U.S. perspective. Let's give it up for uh, Ms. Mundy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to speak with you and to provide a perspective from the National Science Foundation on the development of talent through education. A very brief summary about the National Science Foundation. This is a government organization founded in 1950. Um, it is the sponsor of fundamental research and human capital development across all of the science and engineering disciplines and education. The agency has about a $7 billion annual budget, and it acts by making grants uh, through merit review processes, by making grants to universities and other entities across the country to do basic research and to develop um, human capital and talent for the uh, scientific workforce. You see here the numbers. We have about uh, 55,000 proposals that come to the agency from across the country annually. We award about 13,000 grants annually, and we use a massive system of experts to do merit review. Um, I would say that um, the agency has um, a strong responsibility for, for seeking and funding prospectively talented people, and we have funded 195 Nobel laureates over the years since 1950. The agency employs scientific experts, uh, as well as administrative uh, people to help us do this grant review and selection, and we pay careful attention to the direction of science, the nature and practice of science as it emerges. And so in this new era of science where observation is possible at large scale and at small scale, we are aware of the importance of preparing people who can work with data, who can work with computation, uh, and who can communicate about those findings uh, with broad audiences. So we pay a lot of attention to the frontiers of science. Recently, there was a survey conducted of all U.S. government investment in the STEM, or the, I'm sorry, the science and engineering workforce. And these graphs, which you have in the presentation, show you that in general, there is a uh, investment by the U.S. government at about a level of $3.2 billion in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. This includes the workforce development investment. Um, if we look at the general investments, those total about $2.4 um, billion. And you see here from this graph on the left that the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Department of Education are the major funders of uh, STEM, we'll call it STEM education. Um, the graph to the right shows the investment by specific science mission agencies in the development of the workforce for their particular missions. And so you see here the large investment by the Department of Homeland Security in preparing a workforce uh, in the cybersecurity areas and other security areas. So what guides our ways of investing in human capital? And I'll speak a bit about a report developed by our mm -hmm. National Science Board, which is the governing board of the National Science Foundation. There are copies on the table outside. This report 
is titled Preparing the Next Generation of STEM Innovators, Identifying and Developing Our Nation's Human Capital. And that report recommends that the agency investments be in three areas. First, provide opportunities for excellence. And this is intended to apply to students from the very earliest years, from kindergarten on through graduate school, to be certain that there are opportunities, especially for very young children who show promise in science and engineering, uh, to have their full potential um, challenged. Secondly, and this is extremely important for us, cast a wide net. We are interested in identifying and developing all types of talents in all demographics of students, particularly to reach groups that in the United States have not been fully represented in science and engineering. So we are interested in students from underrepresented um, racial and ethnic minorities, in the participation of women, and in the participation of people with disabilities. Finally, we are interested in fostering a supportive ecosystem that involves parents, education leaders, uh, and students to expect excellence, to encourage creativity, and to reward all students' successes. So these recommendations serve as a frame for uh, explaining briefly the kinds of investments that our agency makes in the human capital for the scientific um, innovation workforce. We make three types of investments, that is grants. We make grants that are direct support to students, and these grants are to attract and retain them in science and engineering fields. So these include scholarships, fellowships, undergraduate research experiences, that is, summer salary for students to participate with scientists in research activities, uh, as well as research assistantships for graduate students. These are opportunities for excellence. Secondly, we provide grants for design and educational research on improved undergraduate programs, improved instruction, and improved curriculum. So the National Science Foundation has a history of funding excellent ideas, usually from university faculty, for what they might do to change the curriculum or to change teaching at the undergraduate level to encourage more students, to retain more students, and to uh, offer them cutting edge opportunities to learn science. And the third category that I would mention here is that we have grants for improving diversity. It's a major commitment of government here to improve diversity by race, ethnicity, and so forth in the science and engineering workforce. Here are a few examples, and these are in your handout, so you can uh, ask me questions later if you wish. These are titles of programs for which we um, solicit proposals from our communities, from universities and professors, to submit applications for uh, participation in and for funding in these programs. So the Graduate Research Fellowship is a program that is at about $200 million. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Integrative Graduate Education and Research Traineeships. So these are the titles of programs that call, call on the field to bring in proposals for us to, um, to evaluate. The third is a uh, scholarship program focused on developing a cybersecurity workforce. So we invest in the preparation of tomorrow's um, cybersecurity workforce. Again, grants that go to universities to invent um, new curricula, new programs, and to bring students in. We consider um, science and mathematics teachers to be part of the science and engineering workforce in many, um, in many cases. And so we fund scholarships because of our challenges in having enough qualified teachers to prepare tomorrow's um, science and engineering innovators. And again, research experiences for undergraduates and scholarship programs. Here's a little more information about our graduate research fellowships. This program started in 1952. It is the government's signature program for identifying the best and the brightest of tomorrow's prospective uh, scientists. And so we have awarded, um, um, we award 2,000 of these fellowships annually. It provides a stipend to the students as well as tuition um, reimbursement, and they have the opportunity for some international experiences while they are serving as fellows. Uh, we get about 12,000 applicants annually. So the process here is to identify potential talent, and we have been working for 60 years at trying to identify the strongest potential uh, when we are looking at applications from first or second year graduate students. Uh, and you can see that we are holding now at this number of 2,000 per year. We also have programs 
<coughs> that are fo uh, fostering a supportive ecosystem. And here are the names of some of those programs. You're welcome to look them up and learn more about what we are doing in each of those. Excuse me. I would highlight the third of these, Transforming Undergraduate Education in STEM. That program funds university faculty to invent new methodologies for teaching students in ways that will engage them, keep them interested, and expose them to STEM in more effective fashion. IGERT, the Integrative Graduate Education Research Traineeships, this program funds trainees and so pays for their um, support and tuition, but at the same time encourages a very strong focus on innovation. So this program is aimed at putting doctoral students into an environment that supports innovation, and I'll tell you more about how we do that. We actually require that every proposal coming into IGERT has an innovation skills training plan for PhD students. And here are the elements of that plan. You can, you can read through or take a look later. But part of what is important is that the students are encouraged to work directly on taking the research ideas and creating a proposal for how to apply those ideas to solving real problems in society. So there's a translation aspect built into their graduate training in the IGERT program. They participate in business plan competitions. There are involvements with mentoring and innovators and entrepreneurs. So this program, we've just started this focus, and we're very excited to see what comes of it as we watch it over the years. A second innovation focus for us is a new program called the um, Innovation Core, the NSF Innovation Core, and I'll tell you a little bit about this. The idea is the agency funds a lot of basic research. That research does not always make its way into the commercial sector very quickly, and in fact, that's not the job of the researchers who do that work. So this program is meant to incentivize and catalyze uh, a translation into the marketplace. So here's how it works. PI, principal investigators are eligible to apply for a $50,000 grant, um, and that grant helps them become part of the development of a team that will take their basic research idea potentially to the market. And we've done this through creation of a national network that includes not just the scientists and engineers, but innovators, business leaders, and entrepreneurs. Every project that gets funded under this program has three parts. There is an entrepreneurial lead, and that is a postdoctoral associate or a student. And it's their job to figure out how to take the scientific ideas and try to move them to market. There is an i mentor who is a volunteer guide who's close to the research team and who is helping them with this translation process. And then there is the researcher who developed the science in the first place. The whole team participates in a curriculum. Essentially, they take a course together. This course is offered uh, at Stanford University, pioneered by Steve Blank there. You can find out a lot more about it by looking at, uh, at the Stanford website, but it's this concept of a lean launch pad. So basically, all the participants go together to learn what it takes to bring an idea from the lab to the market. We have several other programs that are focused on diversity and on casting a very wide net. Here are the names of some of those. In the United States, we have about 100 colleges that are called historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and they are in place to, to ensure a high quality education for students um, of color, students of African American um, background in particular. And so we have a special program for these colleges and universities. We have a special program for our tribal colleges. And then we have other minority um, serving institution programs. Our investment in historically black colleges and universities has been paying off. And we've seen over several years that the black students coming from these colleges comprise a majority of black students who are actually pursuing doctoral degrees across the country, even though it's a fairly small set, only 49 institutions producing 54% of the um, African-American students who are going on to graduate education and getting PhDs. 
Um, and so these programs, this kind of support that is focused on improving diversity is resulting in the, in the uh, greater success of students in graduate school. I just want to, um, to close by mentioning a new program that we have called um, SAVI, Science Across Virtual Institutes. And the idea of this program is, although it is NSF-based and US-based, uh, we are interested in building collaborations across the world with entities that have common interests or common goals. So if there were a research group in the United States that was studying, for instance, education for innovation, and if there were research institutes or programs around the world in two or three other countries interested in the same area, then we have a funding stream available to provide money that can connect those programs and projects, could provide exchanges for students, could provide ways of doing more collaborative work internationally. And so that may be something you'd like to know more about, and you could look at the website to find it. There was a report released just this week about uh, research universities and the future of America. And the focus in that report is on innovation and the role of universities, that the role that universities play in this, uh, in this space. We at the National Science Foundation, through our funding of human capital development, um, hope to be making a very strong contribution to the emphasis on innovation that we see uh, across the nation and across the world. Thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, presentation from uh, uh, Ms. Farini Mundi. That was a very rich presentation. And in developing our talent in China, we also similarly have um, been presented with our problems. And I think that Dr. Mundi had a presentation which was quite inspiring to us. Next, I would like to have. Uh, Mr. Zhang Yan Tong, who is from, who is the Director General from our COSC. Actually, originally, uh, he was uh, working at our Aerospace University in Beijing, and he was one of the high-level uh, assistants to the one of the deans at those universities. And so he has had a lot of experience in the areas of research and development. He will be talking about the development of talent in the whole process of innovation in China. Let's welcome him. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Ms. Mundy was talking about what the NSF uh, has done and is doing in developing talent. And I will talk a little bit about what we are doing and some of our exploration that we do in China. We have three different, I have three different parts to my speech. Everybody knows that in the past 30 years, China has been developing very rapidly and reforming. And it's true still today, just as it was then. And for some time in the future, we will continue to be in a stage of rapid development. So in developing, our people in this type of an environment, we are continuing to explore. Because um, right now, we are in the middle of industrialization. And the whole process of industrialization is still going on. It's a work in process. As a matter of fact, it's in a peak stage right now. And we have, at the same time, new issues that keep cropping up. And we need to develop our talent. And we are facing quite stern challenges in these areas, because everybody knows that in the past 20 years or so, our industrialization has been happening faster and faster, especially with our infrastructure, our roads, our transportation industry. It's unprecedented what's been going on. And then in manufacturing, that is also a big part of our industrialization. Everybody knows it's developing so quickly. And in a lot of areas, we are taking up a very large percentage of world production, especially in some particular products. For some particular products, um, you can see here 
that in some of these areas like textiles, clothing, shoes, and uh, consumer electronics and other products, we are taking up 30, 40, or even 70 or 80 percent of market share, a huge market share. But for these products, right now, they're sort of the low-end products in the market with a low technical content. And they use a lot of resources and a lot of energy. And they're bad polluters. The third thing is that right now we are in the process of urbanization. Um, we've already reached 50% urbanization. And that number is growing by about 1% every year. And in our total 1.34 billion, you can see that we have so many people every year um, that are moving from the countryside to the cities. We've got more than 2,000 counties and cities, and there are more than 200 of them with a population of over 500,000. So this, these are all trends that are continuing and continuing to boom. And at the same time as all of that urbanization is going on, we are and will be for a large time in the foreseeable future one of the biggest construction sites in the whole world. That trend will continue in the future. In the process of all of that, we are in a period where we need to transform, we need to upgrade, we need to reform. It's very important for us, for our economic development, but also at the same time, it's very important. Um, but we have a lot of bottlenecks right now and a lot of problems that are making it difficult for us to do that that we need to work on. In China, we need to transform. This is a very arduous task. And it's also urgent. We had a certain path that we had been following. Um, we'd been high inputs, high consumption, high pollution, uh, not very profitable, and not very high in technology content. That's what we were doing, but it's not really sustainable to keep going on that path. So looking at it from the domestic perspective, our labor costs are also on the rise. And at the same time, Prices of commodities are on the rise, and prices of capital is on the rise, and exports have been affected by the, the, the international financial crisis. So in such a situation, we absolutely must transform the whole method, the whole mode of development, especially when it comes to environmental pollution. Right now, we're under a lot of pressure. And we have to transform in a major way. We have to reform, especially water pollution, because everybody needs water for industrial development. And right now, we don't have enough clean water resources. We're heavily polluted. And at the same time, our per capita production is also very low. We need to rely on science and technology to do this transformation and upgrade of the way we develop. In the next 10 years, China is going to enter a critical period where we need to transform our entire strategy for development. We really need a lot of science and technology personnel. And we are lacking. For instance, Scientists are something that we really need for a new technical revolution, but we're lacking, mm, as well as this um, scientific revolution. Uh, we very much are in need of scientists and engineers as well. We all know that uh, we need engineers for these construction projects, and we've had for a long time a lack of engineers. And we need technicians for better quality, better profitability, better efficiency. We need these types of technicians to improve our quality. Research has shown that there is a couple of ways to train people. One is through education, and the other one is on-the-job training. Education 
is one important way that every country uses to train its talents. And they need to give um, time and support, and they need experience. And a lot of that um, they get when they're in college. But for engineering and science and technology education in China, it's very important that we reform. We need better capacity. We need better capacity for giving them real, actual, practical training, because we are nowhere near what the United States can do in this area. In terms of on-the-job training, we need more. We also are lacking. We need a we need a basis. We need a foundation. We need them to be able to continue to be better in the process of uh, their what they're working, what they're doing, and to be better innovators as they innovate more. In the past 30 years, through all of our transformation, we have done a good job to create much more favorable conditions. Our roads, our highways, our infrastructure, our bridges, our projects. There have been a lot of tasks, a lot of big projects. And we've also trained up a lot of people. But in the next 10 years, for scientific and technological innovation, especially technological innovation, we will be putting a lot into that area. And we think that that is providing actually a great opportunity for us to train the people and a good opportunity for the people, especially in biotechnology, new energy. Um, this will be a new opportunity. These will be opportunity areas. Uh, in summary, you could say that we have a huge scale of these projects. We have a shortage of the people, and we need better capacity. We need more innovative capability as well as more uh, capacity building. According to statistics, we have more than 50 million uh, people in the te technology field. It sounds like a lot of people, ranking number one in the world. We have over two, 2 million research personnel, but the problem is we still have structural problems. They're also looking at engineering education. In the past few years, We've had a lot more of engineering students. Our tradition in China is that st our students want to study engineering, especially if you look at the matriculation records in the past 30 years. You can see that uh, you can see the curve coming up very quickly, especially since 1989. This has been uh, gr uh, this curve has been coming up very quickly, and we've already re reached over 6.7 million in the number of them that's matriculated, and there's a. 35.3% of them are engineering students, but still, even right now, we have a shortage still. We talk, We saw a report talking about our international competitiveness, and it was about engineers, qualified engineers available on the market, and that for five or six years, China has had one of the worst records in this area, the number of engineers that are capable and qualified and available. and. We have a sh huge shortage of them, especially um, highly skilled people. With the, with the people with the highest level of skills is even in a worse shortage than the lower levels of skills. And then in the newer industries, we have, as part of our policy, the idea of uh, working on digital animation, integrated circuits, precision manufacturing, but we also have a huge shortage in these areas. In our capability to innovate, ability to innovate, and our motivation, we also are not doing so well. In a lot of companies, they companies should be the main innovators in the market. However, a lot of these private companies are small, and they don't have the motivation. They're not motivated. They don't put enough into it. They don't put enough into R&D, and the people are then again still not motivated. When it comes to indigenous innovation, we talked about that a little bit this morning, and we talked about uh, copying, pirating. Well, a lot of Chinese companies don't have their own IPR, and they're not willing to spend the money to get it. 
And in some of the large state-owned enterprises, they are in a monopoli monopolistic. Uh, they're in monopolistic industries. They're monopolizing it. They're powerful, and so they are a little better able to innovate, and they have better standards for the people working there, but not good enough. They definitely, compared to internationally, they need to improve those standards in the private sector. They still focus more on export, so they focus more on their current business instead of investing more into R&D. So their R&D investment is lower, particularly in the past 10 years or so. In some fast expanding sectors, such as in the real estate and in finance, some pe people are making money, a lot of money. So what these people do is that they don't really look at the long-term R&D. This hinders their motivation to invest more in R&D. And even some companies have totally given up on R&D. What happens is that these companies don't have motivation to carry out R&D, and in turn, they have fewer opportunities. At the same time, our educational system is also under criticism. For example, our training uh, method is very uh, simple. It's it has not been uh, fully developed, and the result is that our students are not fully skilled. Their skills are not comprehensive enough, and they most of the time cannot uh, research in cross or multidisciplinary topics. That is a very serious problem in our educational system. We have been focusing too much on some parts of the education, particularly the theory, teaching them the theory instead of teaching them hands-on practice. And in our school, like I said, too much theory, too few practices. We don't have a good balance between the two. And also, in terms of evaluation of our teachers, we are not doing well enough either. We focus too much on uh, writing papers for our faculty and our teachers, but we don't pay enough attention to real practice. And for a long time, a problem that has not been solved is that with the development and the progress of uh, technologies, People rely too much on computers and software. They don't really look at the problems themselves. That is a big problem in our education system as well. Our students don't really get to uh, put they, what they have learned into real practice. And also, our teachers in uh, science and engineering don't have enough experience. A lot of uh, teachers came directly from being a student. They have never worked in the industry. They went uh, from being students to teachers directly. And a, another challenge is the uh, integration between industry, university, and uh, governance. Sometimes we are able to have our students intern in the business world. But nowadays, many businesses don't like these interns because they think they are a burden. They uh, interfere with their daily work. And some companies are not able to take as many interns as they used to. So these uh, opportunities for our students have been affected as well. And also in our universities and colleges, their daily curriculum is very heavy, but they don't have enough time to really practice their hands-on uh, skills. So all these problems and challenges are very serious. We have a lot of students, a lot of people, but the structure needs to be reformed. 
That said, we do have some advantages. In China, our S&T innovation is now thriving. The R&D investment has been rising rapidly, and so many companies are now looking at R&D and innovation. Compared to other countries, our students are still very willing to go into the S&E area. We still have many S&E students, unlike many advanced countries. Many students in other countries might not want to study science and engineering. And also Chinese students are, generally speaking, more hardworking. And um, in our job market, we still have a lot of opportunities for engineers. We do have a very big sector that requires uh, more and more engineers in the coming years. So if you want to be an engineer, there is a very good opportunity, very good job uh, prospect for you in China. There is a need, there is the requirement, so it is a very good foundation for students to go into this area. So we believe that as long as we have a good environment, a conducive environment, the students will be motivated. But at the same time, we need to step up our educational reform, which will be good for our training of our people. So in the past decades, China has been exploring these problems, trying to solve these problems. Many reforms were the heritage of what happened in the 80s and the 90s. I would just like to touch upon the reform that we have been carrying out in the past decades or so. The Ministry of Education attaches great importance to educational re reform. They have promulgated a series of reforms to do this work. For example, starting from 1994, we started the so-called reform project for teaching content and curriculum. This plan or project focuses on to innovate on our curriculum because a lot of our uh, teaching, our contents were uh, handed down from the 60s or even uh, the 60s or the 70s and these are very old contents that need to be changed and another project is called the national basis for basic curriculum teaching for engineering we picked a group of uh, universities to build these bases or uh, laboratories to provide better studying environments for SNE students. And another project is called the New Century Higher Education Teaching Reform Program that started in the year 2000. A lot of schools have been recruiting more students, so they don't have enough conditions to support these students. So this uh, project or this program is to help these universities cater to their students better. So in SNE education, we have gained some uh, progress in the past decades. Before these reforms, we had uh, many problems. For example, when students study uh, about electricity or how to fix electronic uh, products, they didn't have enough materials or they didn't have enough uh, support. So what we did is to uh, cut down on the number of departments, make them less specific, but provide them with more resources. And what we did also included uh, a better use of uh, the computer system and a, a more appropriate use of the computer system. Starting from 2008, we have seen even more uh, university and college students. So the living conditions and the uh, educational conditions for these students have been lagging behind, have worsened. 
they don't have enough teachers, and some schools don't have in a, don't even have enough dorms for their students. And we're trying to uh, work on that to manage our universities better. Better, for example, in terms of evaluation of teaching. Looking at this from the historical point of view, in this process, we have to undergo a reform. If we don't, things will get even worse. So this teaching evaluation does play a very important role. And another work that we have been doing is to speed up the reform for developing our talents. In the past, we didn't really look at this. But now, we are now looking at emerging sectors or emerging industries and trying to develop people in those areas. For example, we're now seeing the rapid development of the software business. So we now have software colleges. We have more than 50 of these colleges nowadays in China in order to develop more talented people in the software industry. So these is one of the measures that the government takes. We looked at what has been done in countries like India, and we came back to China and say, this is a good idea. We do have a big uh, sector, the software sector, but we don't have enough people. So we try to uh, establish these so-called software colleges. And it's the same for uh, life science technology. We established uh, life science parks for training of these people. And the same is being done with integrated circuit. This is a fast growing sector as well. So the government now have the national uh, basis for integrated circuit education. Research shows that these as an E talents will go through this pattern. For uh, scientific, for scientific talents, they tend to be younger. And after these people peak, their capability might go down very rapidly. But for S and E talents, it takes a longer time for them to peak. But after they peak. Uh, they will their their value will continue for a long time. So these two types of talents are different. This is a conclusion that we have reached after much research. So we have to focus on these two types of talents. To this, the Ministry of Education is now launching a series of programs. For example, for scientific talents, we have uh, a special program called the Top Notch uh, Pilot Projects. A scientist in China called Chen Xueshen, more than 20 years ago, raised this idea. He asked, why do we not have any Nobel laureates? That is because we don't have enough in basic research. So he called for the training for uh, basic research. So to answer to that, uh, the Ministry of Education in China decided to pick 20 universities in China and established this very program. And they focus on five departments in these universities that are math, physics, chemistry, biology, and uh, computer science to train people in these areas. And we also are focusing more on the training of our engineers. We have a program for educating and training outstanding engineers. This program is being rolled out in more than 190 colleges now. This focuses on how to uh, train our engineer students in the practical field, in the business world. For example, we use uh, credentials to 
motivates these students to research and study. We also look at the design. Designing is one of the most important uh, areas, but we are we have not been doing very well in this area. So we have to better mm, the design in engineering uh, and in their curriculum. We also encourage cross-disciplinary research because we know a lot of the discoveries come from cross-disciplinary research. Without that, it's very hard for them to have any good results. So we are encouraging students to uh, reach out of their own disciplinary. Also, for high-skilled talents or high-skilled uh, people, we now have a special program that is being carried out across the nation. We're carrying out uh, pilot projects. In the past 20 years or so, well, 20 years ago, uh, vocational training only accounted for less than 10 percent of all students. But nowadays, vocational training has surpassed uh, regular university or colleges in terms of number, which is a very good um, phenomenon. So we have a lot of uh, highly skilled people, but we need to have more of those. So under that circumstance, we picked a series of high-skilled vocational schools and set up bases, uh, special bases in those uh, vocational schools. We build laboratories and we invite people in the business sector to uh, come into those centers and talk to our students. Uh, and the fifth is to promote the cooperation between industries, universities, and research institutes. This is something that the Chinese government has been working on. Starting from last year, the Ministry of Education rolled out the so-called a coordination platform to encourage uh, the cooperation between the central government, the local governments, and universities. On the one hand, we encourage uh, businesses to set up uh, to set up laboratories in universities because for a long time uh, businesses were disconnect were disconnected from our universities. So we encourage them to go into our universities and uh, set up these uh, laboratories and research centers to train our students. And on the other hand, we encourage universities to go out to send interns to companies and businesses. But of course, uh, the companies would have to welcome them so that these students can have hands-on practice. Another work that we have been doing is to encourage university staff or faculty to have more exchange with people in the business. Because in the past, we didn't really see this kind of exchange. It's very hard for uh, professors or faculty to exchange with uh, people in the business because our teachers or professors are most of the time working in their laboratories. They don't really go out there. And some uh, professors are uh, very old, but they're still teaching. So what we would like to see more is to have more uh, exchanges between these uh, professors and teachers, between people in the business that they are in. We uh, encourage them to uh, train themselves uh, in the business world. And also, we are now promoting uh, uh, credentials, professional credentials. In the past, students graduate from their universities, but it's hard to see which 
people are more qualified. So we have this credentials program to help us identify better qualified graduates. And another work is to promote the training and transformation for engineering teachers. I mentioned that some of our teachers are not experienced enough. They didn't have hands-on experience. So that has to be changed. In order to improve the quality of education, we have to start from the teachers, the professors. We encourage them to work in the business while uh, teaching. And the evaluation systems in place right now are a barrier to them going back and forth, so we would like to do better. For this type of a system, they pretty much encourage papers, theses, but not innovation. So that's pretty much all they're looking for. They just look at your thesis. They look at the papers that you write, what you publish. So we're trying now to motivate more in the area of innovation itself. Seventh is encouraging industry, encouraging our companies to provide uh, better conditions, more favorable conditions for developing these t talents, these personnel. Because a lot of students graduate, and then they try through trial and error in their work on the job, and that's how they become more innovative. That is uh, one way to improve their sophistication and their quality. So the companies that they work for have to put more into that, and they have to encourage that. They have to do that. or. Uh, otherwise, their people won't have the ability to build that capacity. Right now, our country is encouraging our co industry, companies, to work more in that area and put more into R&D. And I believe as the environment improves, as we continue along this transformation, the companies, industry itself, will attach a lot more importance and will put more into that. In trying to cultivate these innovative talents, we need to have a better system to evaluate them, to encourage them to do things, to encourage them to dare to fail. Um, we know that in some of these big projects carried out um, by our national government, a lot of times people want to make the grade, they want to do what they're supposed to do, they don't want to do anything wrong and they don't take any risks and they're afraid that that will affect their appraisal, their evaluation and their how they do. We at the same time need to have the proper laws and regulations in place to guide that whole process. Instead of spending only 1%, even though we have that law of spending 1% to do this type of education and training, um, a lot of companies don't actually do it. A lot of companies don't pay attention, but uh, we need more work in that area. Right now, we are encouraging these innovative bases, and at some of the universities, we are working on having these bases for transformation and upgrading. And we are having people come from time to time away from their current post that they're at to go for a little training and to try to learn the latest in technology as it exists in the market. That is it for my presentation today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mr. Dong for that presentation regarding uh, what China is doing to educate and cultivate uh, technology talent during the process of industrialization in their country. Next, we have a Q&A session, a discussion period where everybody and anybody can ask questions of the two of them or give their comments or tell us what you think about what they had to say. Let's begin now. I have a question. 
that I would like to ask of Ms. Farina Monday. In your presentation just now, you were talking about the NSF, and you, you said that there are 190 Nobel laureates that have been uh, that have received your funding. So everybody knows that a Nobel Prize is, you know, extreme honor, and everybody knows that the United States is the most innovative country in the world. And Richard this morning drew that chart telling us that America is at the center of innovation. So why don't you have your own world prize that would be your world innovation prize that would be even more influential in the world of innovation than the Nobel Prize? And it might even be of a wider, more diverse type of a prize. Why don't you guys have your own prize? That's my first question. That's my first question. My second question is as follows. In developing people, right now, internet education is very popular. At the NSF, what are you doing to promote uh, online education or online courses? Um, I'll take the suggestion of having a, a World Innovation Prize back to the director and to the National Science Board and get back to you about their opinion about that. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, as for internet education, uh, we talk about um, cyber learning, cyber education. We fund in many, many programs um, various kinds of innovations to create um, online courses, video um, material, virtual materials, gaming is a very big um, interesting area for us. And in particular, we're interested in materials that students can use to learn outside of school. So it's not only online learning that's tied to formal schooling, but the kind of online learning that museums might support or might encourage or television production so that there's a lot more opportunity to get to high quality content through engaging approaches um, that are virtual. And we have many programs. The, the most recent is a program that we've called um, Cyber Learning Transforming Education where we've called for proposals, innovative ideas about how to use the cyber infrastructure for education. Thank you. Um, I guess this is uh, directed to Professor Zhang, but I would be interested in uh, Dr. Mundi's comments also. This whole question of um, building relationships between universities and industry is a very interesting and important question. Uh, and you mentioned a few recent programs uh, that China, and I, I assume it's the Ministry of Education which is taking the lead on this. And you use the term encouraged, uh, to encourage these things. <clears throat> what does the encouragement look like? What, what kinds of mechanisms do you use um, to do that. You mentioned a little bit about changing evaluation questions, um, but I think you know, certainly in this country with Baidol and other things, the intellectual property issues have also been important in making those kinds of collaborations work. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how is it that the, the Ministry of Education can get enterprises and universities and research institutes to cooperate. And what, and then I guess to Dr. Mundy, what can you say about American lessons and all that area? Okay. Huh. okay, thanks for that question. Working together between industry and academia is a very important task, and it's also very difficult to accomplish. Uh, with our educational reform, this is an issue that has existed for a long time and we've tried. We haven't been perfectly successful. Why do I say we're encouraging? Because uh, the schools have their own ability to make that decision, as does industry. So, And what they do has a difference. They're not perfectly together like teeth and gums. So the department, the Ministry of Education, cannot actually ask them or order them or control them, the, the, the industry that is, and the universities. They know that they should be doing that, but um, at the same time, 
they have a very different way of operating, so they're not necessarily compatible. So what we do is we have some programs, some plans to try to lead them, guide them, and encourage them. Actually, our Ministry of Education has a plan. We have a little money toward that end, a fund toward that end, and we encourage them to apply for that fund. Some of the projects, we get them to apply together, industry and academia. And some of them, they have to find a company. We tell them, you find a company, and you guys apply together as an entity, as a single entity. And some of the companies have their own training departments. They themselves can find a university and work together, and then as one entity apply, they can have a center that they've established together, and that center can apply from our Ministry of Education for the funds. And we have the appraisal process from our experts to decide who gets it and who doesn't, and who will be supported. And at the same time, then we have to see if they reach their goals. And that is the way we encourage them. That's one, one way that uh, has been there. These projects, a lot of them are done that way when I say encourage. Uh, Ma'am? Um, so I can just add one more uh, example to this. We do have um, some experience in trying to build these kinds of partnerships. And the most notable example currently, I think, in, in our education um, directorate is the Advanced Technological Education Program. So there we are very much aimed at preparing a technical workforce at the level of a two-year college. So not people who have completed bachelor's degrees, but um, people completing a technical course. And we make grants to community colleges, to two-year colleges that have formed partnerships with local industry. Um, so that the needs of local industry are very well specified and our a, c a curriculum is really created around the specific needs. So, for example, we have advanced manufacturing and a host of other areas uh, to try to build the local economy and also to create uh, educational pathways. Another approach that we use is um, in our graduate research fellowship program, we have an innovation partnership in engineering opportunity or an innovation fellowship. So. Um, so companies that are interested in having summer interns uh, and fellows can come through our graduate research program to find interesting candidates and give them a summer experience in industry. So the partnership begins to build at the level of staff. Um, those are a couple of ways that we do it at NSF. Yeah. Hello again. As someone who spent my entire life teaching teachers how to teach science and technology, um, I can tell you that I'm very proud of U.S. teachers for their inquiry-based teaching and their hands-on and the things that you had mentioned about in wanting in China. And as someone excited about making my first trip to China um, and working with some teachers there, I just want to ask, um, we had a wonderful presentation, but but nothing about of how you're working together because the Chinese students and teachers have so much to give to our teachers in the United States about learning and teaching. And our teachers in the U.S. have so much to give to the teachers and the students in China. And I heard two wonderful presentations but two distinctly separate presentations. Can you speak to how you might be working a little bit more together um, towards the strengths that both countries have. You make a very good uh, suggestions. Uh, I think that we definitely have room to cooperate. Actually, in training of teachers in the past few decades, we've already done quite a lot. We have tens of thousands of teachers and students who have been trained in the United States, and a lot of them are college professors or other teachers, and they um, got their degrees and came back. And then some of them were visiting scholars or visiting researchers, and some of them went to American companies to be technicians and, and stayed there for a little while. Through that type of a process, we have made great contributions to the development of our teachers. As far as I know, regarding American teachers coming to China and teaching there, 
and learning Chinese, including we've had some visiting scholars. I know that we've had those exchanges, and I know that that is one way to go about it. But as for the NSF programs and whether or not we've been awarded any funding or what the funding situation is, I'm not really clear on that. Maybe we could ask our colleague from the United NSF. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for your questions and your comments. Um, I was going to point out that, that we've just met today, and so I think this is a good potential start for, for um, some conversations about what might go forward. Um, I can say that uh, the NSF has funded some projects, fairly small-scale projects um, driven by U.S. researchers who have interests in uh, the preparation and continuing professional development of teachers in China. And so we've had workshops and we have publications, and those typically have involved some level of exchange of scholars, um, often the people who conduct teacher preparation. So not necessarily only um, working at the level of teachers, but looking at the universities and how teachers are trained and so forth. I think we could do more of that. Um, teacher exchange ideas uh, come up from time to time, and I think there's a lot of interest in that. Also, um, the National Science Foundation has been one of the funders of such studies as um, PISA and, uh, and TEDS um, and TIMS, and so some of these international comparative studies provide a nice foundation for other kinds of collaborations that could go on um, further. So thank you for the question, and I promise we'll talk about it some more. Both of you. Mm -hmm. please, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm very loud. Um, please, please remember that the average age worldwide in which kids decide to major in a science or technology field is 11. So whenever we reach to develop programs, we must consider the fact that our kids are deciding. I became a scientist, and I knew by age 12 that that was my lot in life. So. As we look for programs for underrepresented kids, may we reach younger? I know NSF does a lot, yep. but we need to do a lot more. And, uh, and thank you, NSF, for all the great things you do. I'll pass that along. Uh, students, uh, Chinese students have, uh, who have come to the United States to study have played a very important role in the transformation of the Chinese society. The first students who ever came to Yale, foreign students were, you know, foreign students came to Yale in, in the 1860s. Uh, they played a very important role in the creation of the Chinese sure. Republic. Sure. Uh, they were, from my experience, a tremendous role in the development of the Chinese nuclear program and the Chinese space program. And uh, there's a wonderful book written by the son of the former foreign minister, Chen Chi Chen, Liu Xiaomi Guo. I don't know if anybody have read it. Actually, it's very interesting about the experience of Chinese students uh, studying in the United States. Uh, Pete actually brought up in, in his lecture the transformational role that uh, uh, students and returnees are playing uh, in science in China and in science in the United States. I would like to have the views of both our speakers on the role of Chinese foreign students in the U.S. educational system to what regard they're vi viewed as a drain of talent in China or there is so much talent that doesn't make much difference, uh, how many come to the United States, how, how many return, and how you accommodate uh, foreign students in these programs that uh, NSF is trying to establish in, in promoting innovation in the United States. I know it's a very challenging issue uh, with universities because uh, uh, the, the issue of whether you're going to favor a particular student or favor American students, how do you manage the process? Well, I could, I could start with that. Um, and I'm going to start actually from my own experience as a faculty member in universities in um, departments of mathematics uh, where um, Chinese students, other Asian students uh, coming with great interest in studying education or mathematics education, my personal experience has been that the presence of those students has um, first greatly enriched the level of um, and breadth of discussion in coursework and in preparation for um, research <coughs> careers. Um, but an interesting um, sidebar has been that uh, in mathematics departments, such students serve as teaching assistants often. And in order to be well prepared to work with the U.S. students coming into those introductory mathematics courses, 
um, their expectations tend to be very high. We have found with our Asian students in general that they're a little bit shocked when they meet U.S. students coming into uh, a first-year calculus course because of the background being quite different than what they're used to. So I think their presence has actually in some places caused more of a focus on how do we prepare teaching assistants to be strong teachers because we need to help them understand their audience. But that, that aside, um, at the National Science Foundation, um, international students are funded um, primarily as in their roles as research assistants on research grants. Our fellowships and traineeships um, at this point uh, tend to be aimed at U.S. students, but there are exchange programs and um, collaborative programs where I think we could gather much more um, benefit really from the connections to the international community. Let me just add a few words. It's a great question. Actually, China has been sending students to the United States and European countries for a long time. Back in the Qing Dynasty, we have been sending students. And uh, during the ROC years, we've also been sending students. And uh, after the new China has been set up, we are continue to send students to the US. Since reform and opening up, I think we have sent more than 1.5 million students. And about one third, not even one third, one fourth of them have returned to China. So many of them have stayed in the US, some of whom are now teaching at American universities. And uh, a lot of them are now working in the private sector. So looking at this from this angle, students, Chinese students, have been a great resource for the United States. But we have benefited a lot from these students as well, from these returning students who have become the leaders in our SNT area, who play a very important role in this area. So, well, personally, I have been to universities, and uh, if they want to set up a new department, uh, of, uh, usually one of their ways is to send teachers to the United States or to European countries for two or three years. They can come back to China and set up a new department. As for the contribution made by Chinese students in the United States, I haven't done research on that. But person personally, well, I have studied abroad as well. There are a few uh, characteristics uh, for Chinese students. We are hardworking, and we like science and engineering. Unlike uh, European and American students, many American and European students don't like to go into science and engineering. Uh, these departments are occupied by uh, students from developing countries, such as China. Uh, when we go to European or, or, or U.S. universities, we see so many Chinese students in those departments. And it's the same thing with all advanced universities nowadays around the world. We see so many Chinese students, particularly in SNE departments. Well, this is a globalized world, so it's good that we can inspire each other and drive each other. We are now encouraging um, other students from other countries to come to China and study in China as well. And we believe that by having more foreign students, it will help us as well. Having more international students in Chinese universities also show that we are a more diverse society, a more diverse academia that can attract even more international students. <laughs> My question is on Chinese government now encouraging innovation. Do they do this in high schools as well? Or do they only treat high schools as a place where they gain basic knowledge and they can study more in universities and colleges. Do you understand me? Do you understand my Chinese? You made yourself very clear. Your Chinese is really good. Well, for high schools, 
honestly, I don't know a lot about high school because I've always been looking at universities and colleges. But I know that in my office we have several people who used to be、uh, the deans of high schools or even、uh, primary schools. High school is a very important part in our education as well. Well, whether it is for basic、uh, education. Or、uh, applied edu educate、uh, or applied uh, uh, research or education. We start from high school. We try to start everything from high school, but we in、uh, nowadays when universities recruit students, they still look at their、uh, exam scores. Still, so most of the high schools are. Training their students to gain higher scores in exams, in written exams, so they don't focus enough on hands-on training or hands-on practice. But in better,、uh, in in cities that are richer, high schools sometimes they even have a building for S N T or S N E education. That really provides a really good condition for. These students, for example, Mr. Liu is a dean from a high school in Beijing. His school does a good job in this. They give students really good uh, conditions, uh, studying conditions. I've been to his high school many times. Some high schools do, are doing even better compared to universities. They send their students to go to international contest, scientific contest, and they have won many a times. Thank you.、Um, my、uh, question is、um, for、uh, Ms. Freeney Monday.、Um, we've really focused a lot, I think, in this panel on China, really, and not so much as to what is going on in the United States. Certainly, your Presentation talked about、uh, NSF activities, but one of the things that's come out in this panel, and of course, certainly everyone knows who reads the newspaper every day,、uh, is that、uh, compared to China, we have a much smaller percentage of people、uh, in this country going into、uh, science and technology education. That's been mentioned. It's been mentioned very proudly <laughs> by your Chinese colleagues. Um, and I'd be interested in、uh, your personal、uh, reaction to that. I noticed when you talked about the grants that you give out. You know, you have a certain percentage only that get the grants. What are you seeing at the N N、uh, NSF in terms of where the grants are coming from? What th what that means for、um, American higher education, American graduate students?、Uh, are we having a shortage? Are we becoming uncompetitive? Uh, and、um, and then finally,、uh, something that you may not want to speak to. I sort of have a two-part question, but perhaps our educator、uh, does. I think yesterday the New York Times reported about the、um, <coughs> the new voucher system in Louisiana, of、um, where they're really moving away from public education to、uh, private education, and these are primarily religious schools and. Uh, the story talked about one school,、uh, which I assume is training 11-year-olds,、uh, where the scientific、uh, curriculum at the school consisted of explaining what God created in each of the six days、um, uh, of creation.、Uh, and so you might, or if, if <laughs> you don't feel <laughs>、uh, that as a public civil servant you want to respond, I'd be interested in your response to. To what that says about、uh, the current system of uh, uh, training in science in、uh, America and where we're going and all of that. So thank you. That's a wonderful array of many、uh, interesting questions, and I'm just going to to take on a few of them and then hope that my colleague can、uh, pick up the others. First of all, I think.、Um, You're, you're absolutely right that relative to other countries in the world, the percentage of students electing S and E majors at the undergraduate level in the United States is small,、uh, and not growing at the rate that that、um, we certainly would like to see it. And so, 
the way that the NSF can be engaged in that is to really try to better understand why that's happening. Why are not more st why are not more students not choosing the SNE professions? And that in part goes back to the 11 year old issue. We're not catching them early enough and keeping them engaged uh, substantively early enough. Secondly, it has to do with the quality of undergraduate education. Uh, and that's been demonstrated pretty clearly that if the um, instruction in the undergraduate years is not compelling and engaging and uh, creating opportunities for participation in authentic science through research experiences, we see students fall away and get interested in other fields. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that they aren't um, doing well in science and science and engineering, but they get, um, they, their interest isn't maintained. And so um, part of the problem, I think, is to continually work to improve the quality of undergraduate education in science and engineering. Um, a piece of that, of course, is continuing to improve the, K the kindergarten through grade 12, the pre-college years, where we see this fall off of interest at age 11 or so. We see inadequate mathematics preparation in many parts of the country. Uh, we hear universities worry about the need for doing remedial work in mathematics, which is very difficult for the science and engineering fields in that students get so far behind um, by pursuing their kind of catch-up time in, in the university that it's difficult to complete an engineering major then because they've, they've lost out. So we have a number of programs that are interested in trying to create more seamless quality connections between the, the high school years and the undergraduate years. Um, two, feature, two things that I just want to, to mention going on in the U.S. that I think are very promising. One, for the first time in um, many years, we have what, what seems to be catching on as a kind of national standards movement, state-generated standards. I know that um, it's difficult to, uh, for people from outside the country to, to really fathom the, the concept of 15,000 separate school districts that can decide what they would like to have as their curriculum really pretty much independently, or at least by state uh, in, in some rough way. And yet for the last couple of years now, we've had um, 40 plus states agree to try to work toward common standards in mathematics. That is common clarity about what should be taught at each grade in mathematics and there are standards under development for science and there are assessments tied to those with a lot of NSF investment in, in pieces of this work uh, as well as the teacher education to support teachers implementation of these ideas with their own curricula. So, so there are some policy shifts in the country that potentially um, may be a part of the solution but we uh, certainly see these challenges as multifaceted mm -hmm. as well as uh, needing investment really strategic investment at the undergraduate level for, for improved uh, curriculum and pedagogy at the K through 12 level for improved practices and um, better student learning and even in the outside of school learning space where students can stay engaged maybe even if their school isn't offering them good opportunities. Um, there's plenty more to say about the, this uh, Louisiana issue. Um, suffice it to say that as we develop common national standards in science Perhaps that will be a factor in, in some of these kinds of local curricular decisions. You may wish to add more. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, two speakers uh, uh, if you can address the issue of imbalance of uh, people flow. Uh, it's well recognized that over the last uh, three, four decades that a huge number of uh, Chinese students and scholars come to the U.S. to study. And uh, comparative speaking, there's a relatively small number of U.S. students or scholars going to China study. Uh, first of all, do you see this as an issue or not? Uh, and uh, uh, secondly, if you do, and uh, what, what kind of new ideas that you may have uh, or the policy uh, or the programs that you are with that uh, can uh, facilitate uh, U.S. Uh, uh, students, uh, young scholars, uh, to go to China and uh, to spend uh, a good, uh, reasonable amount of time uh, uh, what I mean is that uh, as opposed to a, a week or two, a short visitor, rather than spend uh, six months or a couple of years, uh, maybe even go into the graduate degree. And, and do you have uh, any thoughts and ideas and knowledge about this? Thank you for that question. Well, the teachers and the students exchange between the two nations. Like you said, it's really a big imbalance. Well, this is a objective uh, result of 
the society in China and the United States. So what we see today, it's natural that we have more Chinese students coming to the United States. I think it's a natural phenomenon. As we mitigate the societal gap between the two nations, I believe this imbalance will be improved. Uh, as to how to uh, do this, we are now encouraging students to go abroad. We want them to go to advanced countries to learn from them. And we also want them to come back. We want them to return to China. This is a process that we have to go through. Now it's easy for us to send students abroad particularly in recent years, compared to maybe 20 years ago, we have much, much more students going abroad. With the rising standard of living, we have more and more families who can afford to send their kids abroad. In the past, they probably come out, uh, come, uh, go out to go to college, but now they go out to, hi to go to high school or even primary schools. But and, uh, on the other hand, we do see more and more students from the United States coming to China. Some of them come to China uh, to study uh, different subjects as well. Well, some are long term, some are short term, like you said. The Chinese government is taking a lot of measures to encourage Chinese universities to attract foreign students to come to study in China. That includes short-term research, short-term studies, and language programs, as well as study tours. I worked in a university where they, had a, they have an international uh, program that tries to attract foreign students to study. Some are there for a week, for a month, or three months. Uh, they can choose and pick. And there is also a summer program or research uh, projects or uh, study tours or even short-term cultural uh, courses or language programs. These. Uh, are, are all funded, par partially or, uh, funded. So I just would add that um, certainly the imbalance is, is an obvious uh, fact. And um, we have various programs uh, that could be models for how we could do more exchange um, with China. In particular, we have a, a graduate level program that has exchanges um, with the Nordic countries and an arrangement where students come back and forth. Uh, so those kinds of models are possible and can, can be designed. I think also a, another route, in addition to student exchanges that are explicitly to bring students into, into other cultures, um, is actually through the research investment. So the investment in, in basic research um, along topics that are of international interest. Um, there are ways, and uh, I mentioned one of our programs, this uh, Science Across Virtual Institutes, ways that research groups that would include graduate students and postdocs <coughs> could partner, in a sense, internationally, and that could then lead to a different kind of exchange, which is very tightly tied to the research topic and is not as general. And, and I think a, a, a spectrum of such exchanges would be interesting to consider. Um, Clement from Kissinger Institute here. And I uh, just want to make a very brief comment on the, your question just now. Um, actually, I think the U.S. government has realized the problem of, uh, on the imbalance. You can look at the state, government, uh, state departments 100,000 strong. And I think that's a great initiative to uh, balance out the uh, uh, human um, number of uh, students between the two countries who study abroad in each other's country. Um, but a, a question to uh, the panelists. Um, I think uh, we all realize the higher education in the U U.S. is uh, comparatively better, co have, a, have a comparatively better quality than the higher education in China. While on the other hand, the K-12 education in China is better recognized internationally. I was wondering where it, what is preventing either of the countries having the perfect model with the combination of uh, a perfect K-12 and a nice, very quality, very, very um, 
excellent quality um, higher education, what is preventing that? And uh, where is that sweet spot relying on? You can answer that. <laughs> so I can try. I mean, I it's a great observation. Um, one thing that, um, that I think the United States uh, really stands to learn from China is what it takes to implement uh, at scale, what, it, what might be possible mechanisms for engaging with lots of teachers, lots of schools in productive ways. Um, and, and although we have very different policy infrastructure relative to education uh, at the K through 12 level, I still do think there's much that, that could be learned. And so um, what is preventing this? You know, I think it will take focused attention and, and deliberate, um, planful ideas about how to do those kinds of connections. Um, but they seem fruitful. I have a few more things to say to add. It's true that a lot of people in China have done a lot of research on this, a lot of comparative research on our education systems including higher education as well as compulsory education from K to 12. And some people say that higher education is better in the United States and not as good in China. And some people say it's better K to 12 in China and not good in the U.S. And some people have different opinions. There's a lot of opinions. They run the gamut. So right now we also have a lot of problems with our K to 12, and we're reforming that too. For instance, in our compulsory education system, we have things that everybody's just trying to make people memorize and read and memorize more and memorize facts. And so people are critical of that type of a system. And some people say that the cities are better than the countryside, and that's another huge problem for our educational system. People are concerned, and people are working on solving these issues. And then there's also the children of our migrant workers who come to the cities, what type of an education they'll get. So. In the cities, too, they have good schools, but their children might not get to go to those good schools. So in higher ed, everybody always says and admits that in the whole world, the United States higher educational system is the best, and we should learn from them. But a lot of Chinese students, they have their advantages, too, you know. Uh, for instance, they have a very solid foundation, math, engineering. They work hard, and they're willing to memorize. And so a lot of professors from the Europe and the United States are willing to teach. They like to teach those students. So different types of educational backgrounds uh, provide different types of advantages, and they can work together. And different types of cultural advantages can also supplement each other. So I think that we need to communicate more and exchange more and learn more from each other. I think that's extremely important. I know we're out of time, but I have a very short question. Uh, we've been focusing, as we should, on uh, education and training for innovation in the United States and China. But I wonder if there are any other countries that are models of doing this well, uh, whether it would be a South Korea, a Singapore, a Germany, a Japan. Uh, I just wonder if uh, each of you could comment briefly on your sense of whether there are some countries small, large, who seem to be actually doing a very good job in, in this area. Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Ambassador. I've been looking into that question for years. Comparative education is something that I look at. It's true. We've looked and seen that every country has their advantages. In engineering, we think that the Germans do a really good job. The Germans have a very good relationship between their universities and their industry. And the industry, the companies, work very hard to keep that very close relationship. And that's a good link in their chain, a good chain. And so the students can go straight from the universities straight to the companies without needing any extra training or overlap. And that's something that we'd like to learn from. And in France, they also have um, a lot of degrees and credentials. Um, and they can have people, instead of spending four years, they can spend six years and get a little um, more training, more capability, and more credentials. We think that's a good thing that they do. In Japan, in their higher education system, um, they are trying to do more of um, comprehensive education as opposed to just one-sided or only learning one thing. But they're trying to make people well-rounded. That's what they're trying to do. 
In the United States, I don't have to tell you what your advantages are. You have great uh, innovative spirit, and you they're creative, your students, and they're you know, unique in that way, and so we're learning that from you. We'd like to. And then in Korea, their system's similar to China's, closer to China's. So they have our advantages that we have. But there are things to learn from everyone. Question, Mr. Ambassador, and a, and a very comprehensive answer. I would simply add that if you look at the K through 12 systems and look at countries scoring well on um, on PISA, for instance, you see Finland, you see others that are um, successful in creating opportunities for students at the K through 12 years to learn more applied uh, mathematics and science, to be able to work with mathematics and science in ways that can be related to societal questions, societal needs. And so um, better understanding what goes on in those education systems may be a precursor to then uh, better understanding what it takes to prepare innovators. There's not much time left, so that's all we have time for in this session. We're going to have a 15-minute break now, and after 15, 15 minutes from now, we are going to start the next session.